Good afternoon. I'm Susan Siegel, and I'm president and CEO of the America Society and Council of the Americas. I'd like to send a very warm welcome to our members, special guests, and everyone from around the world who are tuning in to our live webcast. It is a pleasure this afternoon to welcome our guest of honor, Brazilian Foreign Minister Ernesto Araujo, and the Ambassador of Brazil to the United States, Nestor Forrester. After being appointed by President Bolsonaro, the foreign minister took office in January of 2019. He was formerly director of the Department of the United States, Canada, and Inter-American Affairs. He also served as the Brazil at the Brazilian mission to the European communities in Brussels and the embassies in Germany, Canada, and the United States. As the two largest democracies and economies in the Western Hemisphere, the United States and Brazil have long shared a commitment to economic development and prosperity in the region. Both are continental countries with diversified economy, economies and strong investments. The United States is Brazil's second largest trading partner and the most important destination for Brazilian exports and services and manufacturing. At $108 billion, the United States accounted for 19% of all foreign direct investment in Brazil in 2018, the second largest single country stock of Brazilian FDI that year. Last October, Brazil and the United States signed a new protocol on trade rules and transparency, the so-called mini trade deal with provisions which facilitate trade, improve regulatory cooperation, and strengthen anti-corruption efforts between the two countries. This recent diplomatic achievement shows the depth of this relationship and the potential for further cooperation. This is precisely why this meeting is so timely, especially in the light of the new administration in the United States. Brazil is a key market for many of our corporate members around the world. And we thank you once again, Mr. Minister, for joining us today. This event is on the record. The minister will speak and then he will take questions. So if you have a question, please send it in writing to me, the presenter, via WebEx chat, and your question will be added to the queue. Before giving the minister the floor to the minister, it is my great pleasure to first turn it over to Nestor Forrester, the Brazilian ambassador to the United States, for opening comments. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon to all of you who join us uh, here today. I want to thank Susan Siegel and the Council of the Americas for organizing this event with Foreign Minister Ernesto Araujo. Uh, as Susan said at the outset, it could not be more timely as Brazil and the United States enter a new phase in our 200 year partnership between the two largest democracies and the two largest economies in the Western Hemisphere. Our two governments have already interacted on numerous occasions since President Joe Biden's inauguration. Presidents Bolsonaro and Biden have exchanged substantive letters in which they have reaffirmed the bond of friendship between our countries and the core principles and values shared by our peoples. The two leaders have also mapped out the way ahead for cooperation in key areas such as environmental protection, clean energy, trade and investment, science and technology, and of course, the promotion of our democratic values in our hemisphere and beyond. On the Brazilian side, Minister Araujo stands at the forefront of this agenda and has already spoken to Secretary of State Antony Blinken about the renewed relevance of our strategic alliance in the face of multiple regional and global challenges. Minister Araujo, alongside with Environment Minister Ricardo Salles, also had a joint meeting with the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, former Secretary John Kerry, discussing how we can work together on climate change and fighting deforestation and the challenges of sustainable development, both at the bilateral and multilateral levels. Let me just add that we appreciate the role played by the Council of the Americas and its members who have historically supported our endeavors towards a closer bilateral relationship, a true source of prosperity and well-being for Brazilians and Americans alike. The Brazilian government is always open to hear the views of representative groups within both the US and Brazilian society on how to deepen mutual understanding and find new ways to strengthen our ties. 
In this spirit and under the guidance of Minister Araujo, our embassy in Washington has been constantly reaching out to leaders of all sectors to promote a candid exchange of views on all topics. I believe Minister Araujo's presence among us today confirms once again Brazil's openness to dialogue and consensus building and its commitment to work with our American friends towards new and ambitious goals. In closing, let me just say that nobody has been a greater champion for a renewed Brazil-US partnership than Foreign Minister Araujo. And I'm sure you all look forward to hearing from here, him today. I'm sure I do. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Here with you with the master, I'm done. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so th thank you so much to Susan Siegel. Uh, thank you, Susan, for this uh, introduction and also to uh, Ambassador Forrester, uh, who's also uh, doing a terrific job. We wouldn't be able to uh, be doing so much between Brazil and, and the US without uh, your presence there and your amazing work in Washington. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, watching. It's really a, a great opportunity to be uh, here with you to talk about where uh, we are now uh, in the, uh, this so important partnership between Brazil and, and the United States. Uh, to um, assess where we are, uh, maybe we can start by talking a little bit about where we were uh, until two years ago and, and for quite some time. Um, I think we can say that for uh, two, three decades before uh, President uh, Bolsonaro came into power, uh, we had a, a strong deficit uh, of confidence, a very pronounced deficit of confidence between Brazil and the US. For different reasons, uh, we could uh, analyze this or psychoanalyze this, uh, uh, but uh, it, it was there. It was there and recognized by, uh, I think, people from both sides. The uh, uh, impulse was sometimes uh, there for better relationships, but uh, during those three decades, we uh, couldn't overcome that uh, deficit of confidence. Uh, I think that had to do, uh, and it's uh, our self-criticism uh, uh, that speaks here, uh, maybe it was a problem on both sides, but from, from our perspective, uh, maybe the main reason was that uh, since the, the beginning of the 90s, uh, Brazil decided to stay away, stay away from uh, what was happening basically uh, in the world, uh, the beginning of globalization with uh, the, the uh, restructuring uh, of uh, world uh, trade chains, economic chains, uh, and also uh, this new uh, drive towards uh, a world really uh, built for democracy. Uh, Brazil, uh, stayed away from uh, big trade initiatives. Uh, we never uh, uh, wanted to go towards some sort of uh, NAFTA style uh, agreement with the United States or with uh, other partners. Uh, later, uh, Brazil uh, avoided and worked to, uh, uh, to uh, let's say, I don't want to use the word destroy, but maybe it's not too strong the uh, idea of the free trade area of the Americas, the, F the FTAA. So uh, Brazil not only didn't want to be a part of that, but they didn't want anyone to be a part of uh, an FTAA. Uh, and uh, we uh, took um, an adversarial attitude towards um, the US and other developed countries uh, at the WTO, for example. We started to uh, not started, but decided for some reason to just be a part of, let's say, the the developing team, uh, like the uh, as if the uh, the world was divided between two teams, developing and de uh, developing countries and developed countries, uh, which led to uh, stalemates uh, also at WTO level, uh, but not only in in trade, uh, also, uh, and this has to do with our attitude to trade, but it's a different dimension. Uh, Brazil wanted to be uh, a part of some sort of South American bloc, uh, conceived as a bloc hostile to the US, or at least very distant and cold 
to the United States. Um, uh, a block that started to take different shapes uh, in the uh, 2000s, but it was based on uh, a uh, very ideological approach from the early uh, 90s, where uh, some uh, leaders uh, of Latin America, some of them who became uh, presidents of their respective countries, uh, decided to uh, rebuild, try to rebuild in, in Latin America, the Iron Curtain that had just disappeared in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and this uh, more or less uh, converged to the uh, idea of the UNASUL in the, uh, in the year, in the 2000s, uh, even with ideas of uh, building uh, some sort of uh, defense uh, capacity that would be able to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, protect this space uh, as something uh, closed to the, uh, the north of the continent and open to, uh, uh, we don't know what, but uh, so um, this was basically a, a Lula Chavez uh, joint venture, so to say, which uh, of course drew us uh, very much apart from the, from the US, uh, because at the same time we, uh, inside that project, Brazil was uh, also away from uh, democracy promotion efforts uh, in the region, uh, away from recognizing uh, the threats to democracy that were emerging, for example, in Venezuela, because to a large extent, uh, those threats were uh, brewed uh, in uh, in Brazil or, or with Brazilian uh, participation. Uh, uh, this uh, system was uh, irrigated uh, to a large extent by uh, corruption schemes that uh, departed uh, from Brazil, that had roots uh, in Brazil, uh, and that helped maintain some uh, political currents in power in uh, so many other uh, Latin American countries. Uh, so uh, a project that was very different from uh, anything that could fit in into a productive Brazil-US partnership and of course was not conducive to, uh, to confidence between us. Uh, and in all that, it was not, only, not a question of uh, uh, hostility or indifference to the United States as such, it was more, uh, I think, uh, uh, hostility to, the, let's say, the Western model, uh, the Western model, which is not a geographic concept because uh, Eastern uh, Asian, uh, Eastern Asian nations are part of that and uh, other countries, uh, the, the model of a liberal democracy with market economy and uh, uh, openness to the, um, to the world. Um, the model that uh, people opted for at that time was something that we can have give different names to, but uh, one name that I, I like to call it is narco-socialism, because it uh, has to do uh, also the points in the direction uh, of the connections that sort of scheme had with uh, organized crime in the region. So um, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, some, uh, from the point of view of Brazil, uh, preferential, preferential relations started to be built with um, uh, powers from uh, outside the region, from uh, other continents, who uh, became uh, our main export uh, markets and uh, strategic investors in the region and Brazil, especially in the infrastructure. This goes with no uh, criticism to the uh, uh, partnership that was developed with those uh, countries, but shows that uh, for quite some time, a uh, conscious effort was made to uh, uh, replace uh, our traditional uh, uh, economic and trade partnership and investment partnership with the United States and other developed countries with uh, other uh, partnerships. And Brazil uh, shunned uh, OECD uh, as, a, let's say, the cornerstone of that sort of uh, Western liberal democratic model with market economy. Uh, market economies uh, and uh, avoided any other trade agreements, not only FTAA or some NAFTA style agreement, but uh, the uh, EU Mercosur uh, agreement. Uh, I mean, it was there, the negotiations were always there, but uh, never to the point of really uh, be taken for a long time at least to be taken seriously. And okay, let's, that's, uh, uh, that's um, something that we would like to conclude. It was. Uh, more part of the uh, uh, the ballet uh, uh, and not uh, something with um, 
uh, more strength to it. Um, this uh, approach domestically led to uh, deindustrialization because the United States and uh, European countries, especially Japan as well, have uh, always been our partners in industrialization and industrial investment, manufacturing investment, uh, and uh, high technology investment. This was, uh, I mean, continued to some degree because we were always that sort of hybrid economy with some pockets of excellence. But uh, as a general design, very strong deindustrialization during those times. Well, corruption, of course, as you know, uh, I don't need to, to mention uh, a lot about that. Uh, it looked like the, um, uh, the plan was, uh, to uh, paraphrase uh, Woodrow Wilson, was to make uh, Latin America safe for corruption. Right? Uh, the idea, okay, let's let's build this, uh, this space here where no one can come in and uh, where each country and Brazil in our case will uh, will uh, bask in the glory of that the system of uh, a certain circuit of uh, of power and a, a state-led economy. Uh, so uh, we, we lost our our, uh, our place in uh, the global value chains that were being built, and uh, uh, our partnership with uh, key partners like the United States was uh, was not. Uh, uh, I mean, was totally discontinued if, uh, for different reasons. But during those thirty years, uh, in um, in the Obama years during the Obama administration. Uh, uh, and I kind of followed that closely. I was the moment I was working in, in Washington. Um, the uh, idea emerged, especially from the US side, that uh, uh, United States and Brazil would become uh, strong partners in the global issues. And that's where we would build our uh, connection from. So uh, especially uh, environment, but also other uh, issues. Uh, were considered the uh, the key to uh, to partnership. So uh, we would converge there, and from that sort uh, of convergence, the uh, the confidence will, would be back, uh, and we would start building uh, uh, new initiatives and the uh, the part, kind of uh, relationship that Brazilians always wanted. Because that's that's a very important point. Uh, we know that anyone who uh, has been uh, more than <laughs> A few hours in Brazil, I think, knows that uh, Brazilians love the United States. They love the uh, American way of life, American way of doing business. Uh, there's a strong and very deep connection uh, between the two peoples who have so much in common, uh, open, dynamic, innovative societies, uh, open to the world, open to diversity. Uh, but uh, this uh, didn't for a long time, this didn't play out with uh, government, especially with Brazilian government. But uh, so during those years, uh, 2008 to 2016, more or less, uh, we uh, we thought that we could uh, we could uh, build this uh, relationship from the global issues down, uh, and uh, confidence could be restored. But uh, this didn't take place. It was not enough to uh, create the uh, the roots, the, the spirit. That would lead to uh, a, a very concrete uh, partnership. So, uh, because uh, from the Brazilian side, uh, and I mean, kind of with us that, that we that worked uh, with those issues at that time. Uh, at the end of the day, with all the rhetoric, but uh, Brazil didn't want a solid uh, bilateral partnership uh, in trade or in investment or in uh, or in security issues. Uh, among others, uh, because uh, this didn't fit with the model that was uh, still there uh, in Brazil, this model of isolation, of, uh, uh, of keeping the, uh, uh, the power structure uh, in place with uh, those uh, gives and takes and uh, corruption and uh, that sort of, uh, of mechanism. So um, uh, lots of uh, hopes were, were deceived back then. Um, uh, so since the uh, then, I mean, we uh, some some uh, attempts to uh, to uh, uh, catch up during uh, the last um, uh, administration in Brazil, uh, but uh, it was a transitional period uh, in Brazil, 
uh, of course, the elections in the United States with the coming into power of Donald Trump. But uh, this was not a moment that we really could rebuild, especially because uh, this transitional government in Brazil didn't feel it had the, uh, let's say, the um, uh, all the strength that was necessary to uh, go against the current, because the current uh, in Brazil, the establishment, uh, the foreign policy, and to a certain extent, foreign trade establishment uh, are basically, uh, let's say, not not uh, conducive, or they refuse tend to refuse automatically uh, a strong partnership with the United States. So uh, the previous administration wanted to go ahead, but didn't have the uh, the political power, I think, to do that. Um, and uh, I think things really started to change uh, after the beginning of the uh, Bolsonaro administration uh, in Brazil, when we uh, really set to restructure uh, all that with a government that came from the uh, uh, from a, an election uh, with uh, all the legitimacy uh, uh, of a very strong electoral victory. Uh, and it was not only a question of the Brazil-U.S. relations, it was a question of uh, our project of transforming Brazil deeply, uh, of transforming Brazil into a, a modern economy, a market economy, uh, uh, overcoming the uh, old system of uh, not necessarily corruption, criminal corruption, although that too, unfortunately, but of uh, patronage and, uh, you know, uh, that circulation of uh, economic power according, according to a, a political logic uh, and not according to a uh, market logic, uh, uh, and also other aspects of, uh, of transformation. But uh, we really saw that uh, we uh, needed the United States as a key partner, or maybe the key partner for that uh, transformation, a partner in economic opening and modernization, uh, but also in uh, privatization, not only in the, the sense of selling uh, state companies, which is uh, underway, I think that's good news, for uh, our friends uh, in the U.S. and around the world, the, uh, the perspective of privatization of the uh, of the mail, for example, uh, the Correios, but uh, which just uh, was announced last week. But uh, it's not only a question of of that; it's a question of the whole mentality uh, of the economy that we set to and that we're trying to to change to really transform Brazil into a country driven by the private sector, driven by private investment, and not by uh, uh, by public uh, investment, because in the previous system, you had uh, okay, state companies that were misused, but also private companies, the, the champions in some sectors that were um, employed as tools for the system and not as as private uh, as private companies, even employed to uh, export that sort of scheme uh, to uh, other countries of Latin America. So it's it's not easy. It's not trivial to. <laughs> to change that uh, very ingrained system. And we need a partner of the uh, size and capacity of the United States. So um, uh, one important aspect uh, in that uh, equation is uh, reindustrialization. Uh, we uh, lost uh, maybe 30 years, as I said, in uh, being part of the value chains. Today, you cannot be a modern manufacturing country without being part of those of those chains, some specific companies managed to, but not, but because they were, I mean, they were against the current again, uh, uh, and we need to uh, to come back to uh, where we were with, with a new base. I mean, to rebuild the platform for a strong industrial nation. That Brazil cannot, uh, a country this size cannot uh, be a fully fledged uh, democracy uh, with uh, the, in the way to, to prosperity, good jobs. Good, uh, good opportunities without a strong manufacturing uh, base. Uh, in, in those uh, during those previous uh, periods, a very strong relationship was built with China, which is great and which led to a very strong uh, growth in our uh, agriculture and agribusiness sector. Uh, but the uh, uh, the industrial manufacturing was basically forgotten. Also, the more modern uh, services uh, sectors were uh, basically uh, uh, left out. Uh, and uh, what happens is that today, uh, still today, people look at the Brazilian economy and they see uh, 
it from the, the side of, uh, uh, from the angle of trade. And they say, okay, China is, a, is the great partner, which is, which is true for, for trade. But if you look at investment and uh, the, uh, the whole industrial manufacturing sector, then the US and European countries as well are the great uh, partner. The US is number one uh, investor, and then uh, you come with uh, uh, basically all European countries until place 12, 13, 14 uh, uh, as the major uh, investors. So uh, it's a question of, uh, okay, let's keep what we have uh, in the agribusiness uh, and, and uh, all that uh, cluster, but let's uh, go back to uh, industrialization. And uh, so that's what we said also to, uh, to accomplish uh, through uh, much more trade integration uh, with the U.S., but not only with the U.S. This was part of a strategy which led us to conclude the uh, EU uh, Mercosur trade deal, uh, which unfortunately is uh, still not being uh, signed and sent to ratification, but I think this will be the case. But also uh, to our uh, uh, enhancing the um, uh, the um, the bid for uh, OECD with uh, very much uh, political uh, support and technical uh, and technical effort. Uh, also, uh, build a new relationship with uh, Israel, which was uh, basically neglected before. Uh, to come back to a strong uh, relationship with Japan, another very important industrial and investment partner that had been uh, more or less ignored, uh, and uh, open new frontiers with. Uh, uh, partners like India, with whom we are, are having a very strategic relationship now, uh, just launched a, uh, the first Brazilian satellite, Brazilian designed and built satellite was launched from India uh, last week, very uh, symbolic moment for, uh, for us. Uh, the Gulf countries, uh, which were, I mean, kind of were kind of indifferent to now they are key partners, uh, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, all the uh, the six uh, Gulf countries were very much engaged. Just to uh, to show that it's uh, not a question of uh, okay, we didn't like the US, now we like the United States. It's not it's not like that. It's a it's a whole strategy that is much deeper, um, uh, and that's on the economy. But on the uh, let's say security side, we want to uh, to shake that uh, narco socialism system away from. Latin America, we want to, we need to uh, work together with the uh, the large democracies uh, in the region, in the hemisphere, uh, the United States, but also Canada. We have been uh, has been a terrific partner, a very good partner in that. Um, so uh, uh, we uh, uh, and we needed to realize, and we started to realize that in order to uh, to protect democracy, to uh, promote democracy uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, not allowing uh, totalitarian uh, uh, projects to take to take hold, we also need to fight organized crime because they are basically the same thing. Uh, it's uh, it's a basically a criminal network that keeps uh, Maduro in power in, in Venezuela, for example, but uh, also a political power uh, like the one that uh, Maduro still enjoys uh, keeps terrorism and uh, crime. Uh, with uh, bases and uh, uh, opportunities, so to say, uh, in the region. Uh, unfortunately, organized crime, with all those aspects, including terrorism, uh, are alive and, and growing uh, in in the region. Uh, Venezuela is the hotbed for hotbed for all that. Uh, though it's not purely uh, Venezuela, they are uh, threatening uh, democratic systems uh, all across the the region. So. Um, uh, for quite some time and, and still today, when we talk about this, it's seen as a, as a left versus right uh, situation. Uh, and it, it shouldn't be seen like that way. It's not because uh, we uh, read Adam Smith and they read uh, uh, Marx and Engels that we have this problem. It's because uh, you have uh, this whole system that is associated with uh, organized crime, which which is threatening our families, which is threatening our security, even in in Brazil, because they they use the same uh, channels uh, uh, of uh, arms trafficking, the same channels of uh, money laundering. Uh, the, so the uh, the traditional, let's say, corruption and uh, the more uh, uh, modern uh, organized crime, uh, they they basically share the same uh, network. So uh, today it's not left against right; it's uh, clearly uh, a a sort of criminal political system 
uh, against uh, law and order on the other side, uh, open economies and, and real real democracy. Uh, what uh, what we said to uh, to try to do. I, I'm, I'm about to finish. I, I thought that I would take. I didn't think I would take that that, that long with those ideas. But uh, just to uh, uh, give that uh, contrast between uh, what we're trying to do now and, and before. Uh, so uh, regarding Venezuela, we're starting to work uh, much more closely with the uh, U.S. and uh, diplomatic uh, isolation uh, of the regime in order to bring them seriously uh, uh, to the table, which cannot be a, a table among equals, should be a table among the regime, which is dictatorial, which tortures people, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, people who want democracy back to Venezuela. Uh, but also uh, to investigate the, their crimes, their connection to uh, organized crime, uh, we had resolutions of the uh, uh, treaty for uh, in the Inter-American, uh, uh, the TR, right? How is that in English? Uh, uh, the, the Treaty for Inter-American Cooperation, right? Uh, which uh, I mean, it's a very strong uh, instrument that had has not been used frequently, and we uh, we passed resolutions uh, under its uh, umbrella to uh, investigate uh, crimes related to the uh, Venezuelan regime, but. Uh, so basically, uh, the change, the contrast is that Brazil was was part of the problem, and now we're trying to be part of the solution. Uh, I think that's very, very clear uh, in the in the region. And and the U.S. is a key uh, actor with all its capacity, its uh, political, geopolitical power, economic power, uh, intelligence. Uh, I mean, the uh, all the crime fighting capacity that the United States. Um, uh, has. Um, uh, at the same time, we needed and we need the United States to become stronger in, in classical defense. It's, uh, every day it becomes, uh, the, uh, the difference between uh, security and defense becomes more and more blurred. Uh, it's obvious that we need uh, good police forces, but also defense forces in order to fight this uh, threat network that exists in the, in the region. It's uh, it would be great if we could separate uh, security and defense, but uh, increasingly they have to work together. When, and uh, the, the military in Brazil, the uh, uh, let's say a hard power was neglected uh, during the, the many, many years before, uh, maybe consciously, probably consciously, uh, in order to make Brazil a, a non-relevant actor in terms of uh, uh, of hard power. And we need, we need soft power, of course, but... Uh, that that kind of security uh, threat you cannot face uh, only with uh, with soft power, only with uh, movies and songs, right? You need uh, you need hard power for that. So um, uh, so uh, just a, a few areas, a few key areas where uh, the kind of transformation that we want for Brazil for the region uh, pass through necessarily a, a very productive relationship with the United States and how. How we tried to do that by uh, basically by building confidence. So we come back to the beginning by building confidence again uh, around uh, a uh, common vision, uh, and that's what I think uh, Presidents Bolsonaro and Trump uh, were able to do. They were able to create a framework of uh, confidence and uh, a sense of shared uh, endeavor, shared uh, values uh, among them. Uh, which was there already among among the peoples, but uh, among Brazilian and American people, but uh, was denied, I think, for for, ma for many years. So, um, uh, the, the con I mean, for for us who worked with those issues, the contrast was uh, very, um, from Brazilian point of view, very strong. Uh, uh, before we used to, um, in many cases, uh, refuse uh, to. Uh, uh, work for our own values as long as the U.S. was together, all right? We we didn't want to see be seen with the U.S. together in the same room, <laughs> uh, so to say. Uh, I personally have seen uh, that sort of thing happening uh, in the in the previous administration. For example, we, there was already a good disposition to work uh, for democracy in Venezuela. But I have seen, for example, a OAS resolution that arrived and uh, was very good, very strong on Venezuela. But then when people ask, oh, who's uh, co-sponsoring it? Oh, the United States, so we'll, we'll stay away, okay? Uh, 
so uh, the sort of uh, image uh, or, or uh, sentiment was considered stronger than uh, our own values and, and interests in promoting democracy in, in that case. Um, and uh, so since 2019, we started speaking about an alliance, uh, not only about a partnership or a relationship, because that's what we felt we wanted and we still want, uh, something solid, something for the long run, uh, something uh, that is based not in the uh, daily balance of, uh, uh, of give and take, but on the uh, uh, objectives for what we uh, want for our nations, what we want for uh, our, our people, our region, for the world. Uh, and, and we achieved many things during the last uh, couple of years, uh, uh, especially in trade, but also in, in defense and in, in democracy, promotion, uh, in security. Uh, and uh, that's curious because in, in Brazil, it's uh, still commonly argued that we didn't get a lot in terms of trade <laughs> during those two years, uh, or, or that there was, there was an imbalance in favor of the US. And uh, we think it's totally the opposite. I shouldn't be saying that because, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we, uh, we've had the, the three uh, agreements that you, uh, that you mentioned, which of course are, are great for both and uh, start to catch up with the uh, regulatory uh, updating that we need in order to, to promote a strong investment again and investment is coming, uh, but also uh, in, uh, in other areas uh, like uh, that were traditional uh, problem like uh, ethanol, we, we managed to uh, start at least a, a meaningful uh, conversation with meaningful uh, uh, advantages for both sides, maybe more for Brazil this time, but that's not what we wanted. We wanted and still want a, uh, a full-fledged uh, uh, agreement, not only on, on, that, uh, on that area, but uh, on everything. Uh, full-fledged uh, trade agreement. And uh, we, we believe that's uh, totally possible and decisive for us. Uh, but, uh, but not only bilateral, we had uh, uh, progress also uh, multilaterally in the WTO. Now Brazil and the US are partnering for uh, a uh, meaningful reform of the WTO, one that leads to a really establishing a level playing field again in the world economy. Uh, then we have to address uh, tough issues like uh, state-owned enterprises and, uh, and uh, industrial subsidies, uh, agricultural subsidies, of course. But uh, and we're very ambitious as Brazil. Now we uh, want to do uh, whatever is there in terms of uh, competitiveness because we're opening our economy otherwise. So we need the level playing field that the WTO can can provide. And we are uh, side by side with the United States in that in that effort. Uh, the OECD, the uh, totally uh, the size of support from the US for uh, Brazil joining the OECD, which we hope will take place soon. Uh, this is uh, also decisive uh, for us, very important. It's uh, a way of uh, anchoring Brazil in this uh, uh, atmosphere, this uh, model uh, of uh, liberal democracy and uh, market-led economies that uh, we want and that uh, is not. Uh, I mean, it's a it's an acquired taste for <laughs> for many Brazilians in a way. Although that's uh, we're convinced that's the the way to go. But the uh, uh, gravity force. Uh, if we if we leave the uh, the rock there, it will roll down the hill uh, all the way back to statism and to patronage and uh, that sort of of system. So we have to keep going until we can consolidate this new uh, this new model uh, in Brazil because we feel we, we belong there and we belong together with the US and uh, the other uh, democracies in, uh, in the model that the OECD um, uh, stands, stands for. So, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, I said I was about to finish and I, I really am, but <laughs> I think that's a, an important thing to say uh, as well regarding Brazil specifically and, and why we were there uh, in this uh, drive uh, towards uh, transformation and that requires this uh, transformation in the Brazil-US relationship. Uh, because Brazil today is built on uh, what we call, for uh, lack of a better name, the Liberal Conservative Alliance, which maybe sounds uh, strange for uh, American years because of the, the way the words liberal and conservative are, are used, but that's, that's where we're at. Uh, 
the liberal approach to the economy, uh, to build a private-led uh, market-oriented economy. Uh, but uh, uh, on top of a, a, a society that is built on uh, on trust, uh, on uh, strong communities, strong families, on individual responsibility, uh, on less state and more civil society. So uh, this uh, uh, this vision of of conservatism uh, that is uh, the the way that you can describe a society that is built from uh, from the bottom up and not from the uh, from the top down. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of amalgam that we uh, see in, in Brazil today uh, taking shape. Uh, the uh, all the uh, those. Uh, that we can call conservative values, uh, the value of work, uh, individual uh, creativity, individual freedom. I think freedom is the uh, uh, the concept that unites uh, the liberal and the conservative approaches. Uh, the, the, all the, um, uh, let's say the conservative and, uh, and uh, liberal values converge there and, and converge towards a, a, uh, a market economy in, in terms of the economy, but also uh, in, uh, in a, sh uh, a society that is shaped that is solid and shaped on uh, on shared values in terms of uh, the uh, let's say the uh, the, the non-economic aspects of uh, of social life, uh, and, and that's where that's where we want to to meet the United States from, and that's where I think we are uh, we are now. Uh, and uh, I would like to say that uh, talk a lot about the the past or the recent past, but what where we are now? We are the same place that we were. I mean, uh, nothing changed for us on January the twentieth regarding what we want to accomplish and uh, the importance of the partnership of the, uh, with the United States. Uh, we think it makes total sense. It, it makes total sense from uh, the, the material, the, uh, the concrete uh, trade and economic interest, but also uh, our vision of the world, the way we uh, need to work together for democracy against organized crime, um, uh, against threats to democracy and uh, in the region, maybe in the world as well. Um, so our, our determination to have a strong alliance is, is there uh, because it, it's rooted in what Brazilians feel. It's rooted in uh, this uh, uh, the sentiment that I call the liberal conservative alliance uh, in Brazil. It's rooted in, in history and in interests and in concrete interests uh, and in this uh, drive to uh, to transformation. We. Uh, we are, I think we're together in, uh, and we'll be together in everything with the, uh, with the Biden administration um, as before, because uh, it's the natural thing to do uh, in, uh, in our view. We were absolutely together in climate. That's very important to say uh, in conversations that uh, uh, myself and uh, Ricardo Salas, Minister of uh, the Environment, had with uh, John Kerry and the technical work that is going on uh, after that shows that uh, we are, we can work uh, as key uh, partners towards uh, not only a successful uh, COP26, but a, a reshaping um, of the, um, uh, or not reshaping, but the fully implementing of uh, climate uh, instruments and climate agreements. Uh, uh, there's no, uh, there's no philosophical difference there. Uh, there are differences of uh, approaches uh, how to do this, how to do that, but uh, and, and overall the, uh, the disposition for for cooperation regarding deforestation, for example, is totally there. Uh, the disposition for uh, meaningful uh, investment in the sustainable development in the Amazon, for example, uh, seems to be totally there. Uh, so uh, something that was regarded as maybe an impediment. Uh, to uh, uh, to this uh, to the continuation of, of this the drive drive towards an alliance. Uh, I mean, it's totally out of the way now. We we're working together also uh, in that uh, in that area. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you see, I'm very upbeat about what we uh, we can do. And uh, just to finish, uh, I'm only sad because some currents uh, are still want to keep Brazil and the U.S. Uh, away from each other. Uh, currents in Brazil, especially, which uh, know what this means for the transformation uh, that we uh, undertook to do in Brazil, uh, and want us to. They know that how much weaker this uh, transformation will be without a strong 
Brazil US partnership and uh, how much easier it would be to go back to the uh, older system, uh, which was, I think, bad for everyone, uh, for uh, economic development, but also for for democracy, and not only in Brazil, in, 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 but in the whole uh, region. But uh, I think those people are, are a minority, those currents are a minority. Uh, and what we hope is that uh, everyone uh, who looks at this uh, in good faith, and uh, I think it's everyone here, uh, obviously, uh, can see the, uh, the enormous value of uh, of this alliance. I use that, that word again uh, in, in permanent construction, but I think we need to be very ambitious and, and we'll see that it can totally be uh, accomplished. Thank you. So, sorry for speaking more than I was supposed to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Araujo. And I have at least 20 some questions that have come in as you spoke. And so I'm going to try to bundle them. I think you've spoken to a lot of them, but we have a number of questions that are very specific about how uh, President Bolsonaro and President Biden can build their relationship personally. And is there a bilateral meeting um, on a possible bilateral meeting on the table? Um, maybe if you could just address that in two minutes and then we'll go on to um, another set of questions around the Amazon, the climate, et cetera. Sure, sure. Um, no, we have high hopes for that. Uh, well, first of all, they, they have the same initials, right? JB and JB. I hadn't thought of <laughs> that, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, no, I think uh, the relationship can be very good at presidential level. It's very important that it be, uh, it be uh, very good. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I think, we have uh, uh, the uh, let's say the same approach to the fundamental uh, things that uh, are there. I think that was reflected in the, uh, the letter that President Bolsonaro sent to uh, President Biden, and the letter that President Biden uh, sent to uh, President Bolsonaro this week. Uh, th those those key uh, issues, those key those pillars of uh, uh, of this building uh, are there: uh, democracy, prosperity and uh, values, so to say. Uh, and uh, this is a more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, difficult to, it's more difficult to define, or, but uh, it's totally there. Uh, some uh, nuances uh, that we recognize in, in the administration regarding climate, for example, which was not that much of an issue in the previous administration, but they, I think they come from the same, uh, uh, from the same approach and, that, and we are converging to that. Uh, maybe with uh, different instruments, but the uh, uh, the values are there. And uh, I think they're both uh, practical oriented uh, leaders, uh, leaders that want to uh, to leave uh, uh, something uh, strong, uh, not only to, uh, to, talk, to talk about uh, stuff. Uh, leaders were not uh, afraid of uh, uh, taking uh, tough decisions as we uh, have, have seen uh, in Brazil for uh, for two years and in the West now for uh, a little over one month. Uh, and in our case, we clearly need, need uh, tough decisions uh, in order to uh, really transform the system. And as I said, uh, it, it, especially in the beginning, it was going against the current to uh, uh, to uh, build this partnership. Uh, so we, we see that sort of uh, political courage uh, and uh, enormous uh, public support, I think, in both sides for both uh, presidents. Uh, you know, they both come from, uh, uh, let's say, record uh, numbers in terms of, uh, uh, that's another coincidence, in terms of uh, votes in their respective elections. So uh, I see only a, a, good, uh, a good perspective in, uh, let's say, the, the personal uh, interaction. So um, thank you very much. Um, so, following on, um, are you doing anything specific, the, is the Brazilian government doing anything to remove the obstacles in relation, not just with the Biden administration, but with the European nations created by Amazon's deforestation? And I'll go one step further, because there's also another really interesting question, um, which uh, is, uh, what are your expectations? What are Brazil's expectations for the April 22 Leaders Climate Summit? And what sort of result would constitute a win, in your opinion? 
Sure, sure. Um, Yes, uh, yeah, with uh, Europeans, we have been uh, having uh, this uh, uh, discussion since we uh, uh, finished the negotiations uh, of our EU agreement in 2019. Uh, the agreement already has uh, lots of uh, instruments that reinforce um, environment uh, protection and environment commitments, but we, uh, we realized that. Uh, uh, the uh, European side wants to see, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, reaffirming uh, of those commitments, and uh, we are ready to uh, to work to, towards some. We don't want to reopen the agreement because then we would have to negotiate everything from steel to cheese, and okay, this would be impossible. Uh, but uh, and especially, we're open and with any partner to uh, to show. Uh, that there are a lot of mis uh, misinformation about uh, Brazilian uh, environment, uh, about our agriculture, about uh, the connection between agriculture and uh, deforestation in Brazil, which is basically non-existent. I mean, it's hard to uh, right, but that's basically the the fact. Of course, there is illegal deforestation that we're being combating, but uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, there's no uh, let's say incentive. Uh, and no agreement we would we would do. We want to sign any agreement that would uh, uh, mean incentives for uh, deforestation in terms of uh, agriculture uh, production. Our agriculture is growing because of uh, technology. It's growing because of productivity and not because of uh, incorporation of new uh, areas. And uh, it has immense uh, potential to grow. Uh, on top of technology uh, from uh, our, our current agriculture area, uh, basically only one third uh, is today using the most uh, up-to-date uh, techniques and technology. And, uh, so you can imagine what Brazil can accomplish with uh, and without any sort of deforestation, any incorporation of the land, uh, we could, I don't know, double, treble the uh, uh, the production with uh, the incorporation of technology. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing we um, we need to uh, to put on the table because we can not only show that that's the case in Brazil, but also contribute to uh, uh, to better agriculture uh, practices in other countries. Uh, uh, we can uh, contribute uh, our uh, uh, let's say the uh, the energy uh, energy uh, matrix uh, in Brazil. I mean, not directly, but uh, our experience with the uh, uh, energy matrix, which is uh, uh, seventy percent uh, renewable for electricity, for transportation, a little bit less, but for uh, electricity, uh, it's uh, 70, 70, 70 percent, um, right? Um, uh, uh, it's uh, it's renewable. So um, we, we have a lot to show, not only uh, that we are facing our problems, but we have solutions to, uh, to present uh, worldwide. And that's what we can do with the U.S., with uh, European countries and and others directly with the United States. Uh, those uh, conversations with uh, uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, team. Uh, I mean, this is pointing uh, very well. Uh, and then we go towards uh, not only COP26 but towards the Earth Summit in uh, April. We uh, we do think we can arrive there with something uh, significant. Uh, uh, from our perspective, what is very important is everything that has to do with. Uh, Financing, right? Uh, we want more to see. We need to see more commitment uh, from uh, from the richer uh, nations, uh, from developed countries, uh, in terms of uh, implementing the, uh, the financial commitments uh, of the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, as you know, uh, the Kyoto Agreement. Uh, I mean, the, the, those countries fell short of uh, financial commitments under the Kyoto uh, Agreement, and now we we need to. Well, ideally, we would. Like to uh, to see those commitments <laughs> uh, fulfilled and and the uh, and the new ones under the Paris Agreement uh, fulfilled, uh, but uh, we uh, we we think we can get there. And uh, if we get there, we have the best of the world because you have uh, all the commitments uh, for for protection, uh, the uh, contribution that we can give in terms of uh, technology, and also uh, green investment. That's what we need the most uh, in Brazil for the Amazon region. Uh, it's not uh, only a question of curbing uh, illegal deforestation and eliminating illegal deforestation. For that, you need, I mean, you, you need not only uh, policy uh, operations, but uh, but uh, investment to create green jobs, to create opportunities for those people. 
23 million people live in the Brazilian uh, Amazon. Those people need need jobs. They are mostly poor and uh, don't have decent opportunities. So if we can uh, package uh, all of that together, uh, it's really a, a total game changer. Thank you very much. It's a win-win for all, I would guess. Um, so we have four more minutes. I've got 20 questions, but is it rolling <laughs> on in? But I'm going to ask you this one. And if we have to, I'm going to ask you for another meeting in another couple months to continue. Yes. Uh, yes. So Brazil has an important role as one of the largest democracies and as a leader and role model uh, country for peace. We're seeing more cyber threats and nation state attacks, Initiatives, initiatives such as the Paris call for peace and security in cyberspace is an important multi-stakeholder approach to create a trust and safer digital environment for countries and citizens. Do you think Brazil is going to join this principles initiative? Um, yes, I mean, we uh, uh, have to work uh, in that direction. Cybersecurity is obviously a uh, part of those uh, that threat network that we uh, that we see that we have to face that we have to face. Um, so, uh, uh, but it, it's it's I think it's a part of the new uh, cyber uh, threat uh, world. Uh, of course, we have uh, state actors, but also non-state actors that can be uh, the source of, uh, of insecurity in that regard of threat. Uh, and uh, we uh, we do see, of course, the, the, the potential of the, uh, uh, the new technologies of the new economy, especially now with the pandemic, we're realizing that the digital economy is, uh, I mean, it's uh, totally there. It's maybe more than half our, our economy now is dependent on, on digital. Right? But, uh, so uh, we have to be even more conscious. It's not only that I think the, the classical cyber threat, uh, you know, a, a state actor threatening another state actor. It's the whole, uh, it's the whole uh, gamut of uh, uh, of threats that also have to do with, um, uh, I mean, the exposition that people are so much exposed now to uh, uh, to being hacked, uh, uh, and they'll be much more so, and having all because they have all their life hackable, uh, so to say, and with the uh, the Internet of Things companies, everyone will be uh, exposed to uh, basically not only uh, the, the big power structures in a country, but uh, everyone, uh, uh, their their fridge <laughs> or their uh, their car can be subject to, uh, to hacking, right? Uh, that's what we need to work with all the international community uh, to, uh, uh, to find a way, uh, right, which is not easy, to uh, not uh, curtail uh, technological development, but uh, to do it inside the democracy, inside democratic uh, principles and, and values. So I have one last question, because in the day of, of COVID, we can't go without asking at least one question on COVID. Sure. We have four or five. And so um, they're questioning, you know, Brazil's handling of coronavirus pandemic and the current um, struggles with the Manaus variant and others. So. Uh, what could go wrong? How can you get Brazil uh, vaccinated and on the uh, path to a normalcy, let's say? Um, and so what's your vision and what's President Bolsonaro's vision for this, please? Sure, sure. Uh, it's very good. And we, we were having a, a meeting this morning uh, about those uh, those issues. I mean, we're almost daily, <laughs> we're discussing uh, the pandemic and, and the strategy uh, almost every uh, agency is involved. So uh, we're taking it, I mean, tremendously seriously. And uh, we see uh, regarding uh, the, the number of cases and the number of deaths, which uh, so uh, tragically has gone up. But uh, uh, apparently it's normal after the um, uh, start of uh, strong vaccination that the cases go uh, up in a country and then they, uh, they abruptly uh, fall. We might be uh, uh, two or three weeks away from uh, that point if you take the same curve in other countries where cases would start to fall. Vaccination is uh, gaining speed. Uh, of course, we would have would like it to be uh, much quicker, but uh, it, it's slow compared to the US or Israel. Uh, but if you compare to Europe, it's not that slow. I think European countries are a little bit more than 5% in terms of total population vaccinated. Uh, in Brazil, we are about 4%, right? With all the uh, logistical uh, challenges that we have, uh, but the uh, the numbers will go very steeply up. We're, we're pretty sure uh, in the next few weeks, also with uh, vaccination. 
uh, and uh, uh, I mean the the, uh, the health system is uh, of course under uh, under stress, but it's it's holding fine. Uh, the uh, intensive care units uh, uh, there's some shortage in some states, but uh, we overall the system is uh, is holding fine. Uh, and uh, people want to basically, of course, people want to be vaccinated, but also people want to to go back to work. There's strong popular pressure for the uh, for not having lockdowns or for ending lockdowns that have been decreed by some uh, state governors. And uh, I think with this this mix of uh, uh, the, the natural fall in the number of cases, even of the new variety, which uh, seems to be following the same curve, uh, uh, vaccination and uh, uh, let's say, and the the, um, the the drive towards uh, normal life uh, again. Uh, this uh, the the economy will take will take. Uh, uh, I mean, the economic growth will take hold again. People will start to feel confident again to to uh, come back to the beginning. We also need to uh, uh, the uh, question of confidence among people. Uh, but uh, the the popular sentiment is that uh, we we need to go back to work. So as soon as we. Uh, have a decent, uh, we already have it, but when we have a vaccination really uh, showing it, it's making the cases decrease, uh, things will look much better, I'm pretty sure, in, in a few weeks. Well, with that, Mr. Minister, our time is up. In fact, we're two minutes late. Yes. We still have so many questions, so I'm going to have to invite you back. Yes, yes, by, by all means. I, I promise to start by answering the question next time and then I talk. I'm delighted. We'll start with an interview. So I want to thank you for your very valuable time. You know, we agree that there is just so much that Brazil and the United States can do together. We have common values. We're we're continental country. We have huge resources. Um, and together we can do so much um, in terms of leadership um, in the hemisphere and in the world. And frankly, I'm a big believer, as I know you are, that this hemisphere can be the most competitive hemisphere in the world if we all work together. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your work and good luck I, on your trip to Israel. Um, yes, yes. So much promise that you were telling me about. So thank you yes. and be safe.